everybody. Thanks so much for coming. I'm Susan Stinson, writer in residence at Forbes, and this is the Local History, Local Novelist series. And um, I want to tell you um, one thing that the next um, event in this series is on January 2nd. It's an evening inspired by James Baldwin and Ekwemi Michael Thelwell will be here, along with um, Linnell Moise, who's a poet and playwright, and Ms. Singet Smith. So that's going to be really fabulous. And um, there are flyers out in front for the whole series and for that event. So please come if you can. Um, and one thing that I love about this event is that place is present in so many ways. It's the organizing principle behind the fantastic new literary magazine, The Common, which is right up there for sale tonight, and um, which is subtitled A Modern Sense of Place. It's the topic of conversation tonight, writers, specifically writers of fiction and place. It's one of the core impulses for the whole local history, local novelist series. And for those of us who are here, it's an experience we'll have together in the library, an institute, institution that I love that's been offering a place for books, ideas, and community for a long time. The accumulation of experiences and therefore memories in a place is a beautiful, defining thing. I'm looking forward to the experience we'll be having tonight with these very fine writers. And, um, Jennifer Ack Acker is um, moderating the event. She pulled together this whole fabulous panel, which is so wonderful. She's the founding editor of The Common, um, and she's of the, she has an MFA from Bennington writing seminars, and her translations, essays, and short stories have appeared or are forthcoming in publications such as Harper's, The New Inquiry, The Millions, Ascent and Plowshares. And I also want to say that I know that Jennifer is a wonderful editor because I worked with her uh, on a piece of fiction for The Common and she made a suggestion that transformed the experience of that piece. Jennifer. Susan, thank you so much. We've had a number of lovely uh, collaborations around the common and all of your uh, wonderful work and your own fiction. So I really appreciate the invitation to do this because I got then the chance to invite these lovely writers to join us tonight. So thank you everyone for coming um, and um, coming to talk about sense of place and fiction. Um, so many people in this room have been involved in the common in big and small ways and so it's a uh, Lovely to be here in this community. So um, I think what I'll do is just to introduce everyone sort of down the line so I don't keep getting up and, and getting down. Um, and so we will, um, uh, everyone will read for a, a little bit because I want you to hear what, um, what uh, you know, some, some of the writing in their own voices. And first up, by virtue of where she's sitting, um, is Amity Gage, uh, uh, who is the uh, fiction writer at Amherst College now, um, and before that, Emma and Holyoke. And she is the author of three novels, uh, Oh My Darling, The Folded World, and Schroeder, which is forthcoming from 12 Books Hachette in February. And um, that's 2013. So I've heard a little bit of this uh, book before, so. I'm looking forward to you uh, hearing some of it. Are you reading from that yeah, tonight? Yeah. Okay. Um, Victoria Riddell, uh, fiction writer and poet, um, and we've uh, been fortunate to include some of her poems in common. And she's the author of three books of poetry and three books of fiction, Woman Without Umbrella. Her recent collection of poetry was published just this fall, so that's the most recent book um, but she also has a collection of short stories coming out in the fall of 2013. So we're going to talk a little bit about place in poetry and fiction, I hope. Um, and Claire Massoud uh, is the author of four books. Her most recent novel, uh, The Emperor's Children, was one of the best books of the year list in the Los Angeles Times, The Economist, The Chicago Tribune, and People magazine. And her next novel, New Galia, right there, The Woman Upstairs, um, will be published in spring of 2013. So enjoy the readings, and then we'll uh, have a little discussion. Uh, 
offshoot. Did I ruin it? Um, <laughs> I'm not really this tall. I have very tall heels. <laughs> um, uh, I, you can hear me. It's not yeah. too big a room. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to read from uh, Schroeder, which this is also a galley's forthcoming in February of, of 2013. Um, I'll just try to contextualize the scene. I'm going to read a little bit, and I chose the scene apropos of our topic tonight. But um, uh, So this story is told um, from the point of view in, in first person of um, a man who calls himself Eric Kennedy. And um, it's really an apology, both in the sense of everyday sense of the word, as in, I'm sorry, and in the uh, sort of classical sense of uh, self-defense of his uh, choices. And he's writing his um, apology to his ex-wife, his estranged wife. And it's really about his, um, the occasion where he, um, during a parental visit, um, basically kidnaps his own daughter, his own six-year-old daughter, and they go on a road trip together. And um, so the, this scene it takes place soon after he makes the fateful decision to kind of go away um, with her, and she's complicit, um, his daughter. And um, what else do you need to know? Probably that his name is not really Eric Kennedy, his name is Eric Schroeder. So he's actually not who he says he is. And so this is, uh, he's, a, he's a German immigrant. And th so he uh, you know, has a lot to come clean about during this book. Um, and the U in the story, the addressee, is, is, his, is his wife, as I mentioned. Uh, I think that's probably enough. This section is called Most Beautiful Water. Lake George hasn't changed. It's still an oceanic, slate blue tableau when you come across it a half hour's drive north of Saratoga Springs, propped there in the Adirondacks 320 feet above sea level. Its basin stretches from the town of Lake George all the way north to Ticonderoga, its western border a series of goofy little pleasure towns filled with motels, water slides, and pancake houses. Driving northward, full of anticipation, Meadow and I sang. We sang our favorites like Yellow Submarine and Kentucky Woman. We were together again. It was easy. For the first time in a year, I felt some hope. I felt like I had finally taken back some control. No more rope-a-dope in divorce mediation. I knew we were going to make it to Lake George. I knew that, and I didn't give a shit about what happened after that, frankly. It was unseasonably warm for June. We rolled the windows down and sailed our hands in the air. We didn't stop, and we didn't stop. We didn't stop in Saratoga Springs. We didn't stop at Lake Luzerne or Glens Falls or anywhere. We didn't even slow down until we'd entered the Lake George Strip and Meadows started shouting popcorn, candied apples, frozen lemonade. The water parks and the go-kart tracks had opened early and tourists like ourselves were walking around half-dressed and jaundiced from winter. We had been here the summer before, Meadow and I, and you know who you are, I mean our family, in what we might term year zero, to be followed by the post-divorce epic, or anum repudium, but neither of us mentioned that. <laughs> we parked on the street and ran down past a band shell and a playground and straight onto the small, hard-packed public beach near the dockside. Meadow wound her way through the sunbathers right out onto the sand, and to my surprise, waded into the water with her clothes on. She stopped only when the water soaked the hem of her shorts. Daddy, she cried, turning back to me, it's cold. Of course it's cold, silly, I said, ro rolling my khakis up to my knees. It's 200 feet deep. Come on, let's buy you a suit? No, Daddy, not yet. I smiled, secretly pleased, remembering how impossible it always was to tear her away from whatever her attention had seized upon, a bottle cap, a ladybug, the removal of sticker-backing goo from a glass bottle. I put my hands on my hips and looked around at the crowd of bodies. Some were inching their way into the icy water, others were spreading out picnics, parcels of tin foil, coolers of ice, everyone trying to save a buck bringing bologna sandwiches from home or smoking generic cigarettes like Basics or Viceroy's because we were all into it by then, the recession. We were all inside it or knew we were about to be. An attractive young family was lounging close to the waterline near Meadow. I smiled at them, all four of them, that idealized American square, a large, good-looking father wrapped by the movements of the distant steamboats a strawberry blonde mother in a sturdy bikini, a sarong wrapped around her waist, and two focused children digging in the sand. I said aloud in their direction, a day like this just melts away the stress. 
The, the petite mother glanced my way. It is too pretty today, she said, isn't it? My problem is when it's this pretty, I just want to keep it. I just want to box it up and keep it and have it last forever. Oh, don't think like that, I said, taking a step or two in her direction. That'll just make you sad. She smiled, tilting her head slightly. Anyway, I said, you know where you keep a day like this? You keep it in your heart. That's the box you keep it in. My eye on Meadow, now almost up to her waist in Lake George, I grinned down at the women's children. Hey, you two. Below us, her children ignored me, just as her husband ignored me. I probably could have kissed her on the mouth, and he would have kept on muttering about the steamboats. I felt a rush of fellow feeling. My pity for her, and for me, and for her kids, and for my kid, and even for you, Laura, came over me in a wave so sudden and so felt that I almost lost my balance. I closed my eyes. I feel, I thought to myself. I clenched my hands open and shut. I feel, I'm alive. When I opened my eyes, the woman was staring at me. Are you all right, she said. I'm great, I said, never better, in fact. Along the weathered dockside, people strolled quietly, but for the creaking of the dock boards and the oars and their oarlocks and the chanting of vendors and the distant churning of the steamboats, the crowd seemed hushed, awed. The world was softening, opening up. Spring always feels like such a victory, I said, like you did something good to deserve it. That is so true, said the woman. Plus, it was such an icy winter, icy and slushy and ewy. One of the worst at least in my personal history, but I looked at her. I guarantee you it's going to be an extraordinary summer. She smiled again, displaying two pearlescent front teeth with a pretty little gap. Really, how do you know? I just do. Butterscotch, I called to Meadow, come back a bit towards shore, okay? The sign says no swimming, there's no lifeguard yet. I'm not swimming, Daddy, she called without turning. I'm, I'm fishing. My friend and I exchanged a pair of knowing looks whose covert purpose was legitimate eye contact with one another. Are you and your daughter staying on the lake, the woman asked. It's going to be a beautiful weekend, they say, unseasonably warm. No, I sighed. We've got to head home. We've got a long drive ahead of us. Where's home? Canada. Oh, you're Canadian? That's a lie. It's not Canada. The woman, <laughs> the woman blushed again, and I detected a faint note of disappointment, as if she'd already become attached to me. I always expect Canadians to look different, she said, but they never do. <laughs> it's how we speak, I said. You have to wait until we start talking about how sorry we are. The woman laughed, sweeping her foot in the water. And your girl's mother? Is she back at home? Yes, I turned to face her. My wife's back at home waiting for us. In the background, my friend's husband dimly became aware of me. She keeps calling us, I said. How many miles left now? How many more hours? I miss you. She misses us. Of course she does, the woman said. I watched her face, slightly rosy with the thought of it, whatever it is, the universal dream, the dreamed us. The wind played with the beaded hem of her sarong. She pulled one foot out of the sand, and the sand made a crude suctioning sound, and the steamboat tooted in the distance, and I finally looked away from her and across the lake at the hills. Isn't that something, I said, overwhelmed. The way the light is growing long on the hills across the lake. Look at that. The way the hills seem in a different dimension over there. What an afternoon. You're right, you know, this day should not be allowed to end. We should be allowed to keep it. You know what? This is the first time this year I haven't felt like jumping off a bridge. I looked at my companion. A breeze blew her hair off her brow, which was pinched sympathetically. I know you don't even know me, but I'm glad you're here, I said. I mean, I'm glad you're here with your family. Your family makes me happy. Oh, she said. It's good, don't you think? It's the point, don't you think? Togetherness, like this, in families. She gazed back at me, her expression uncertain. Hey, Tex, the husband bellowed, your kid is swimming in her clothes. We all looked in the near distance, but we all looked in the near distance, but with commitment, Meadow was indeed swimming, her head held stiffly just above the water. Just then, the sun reemerged from the sky's lone cloud, spilling outrageous light across the surface of the lake, which now seemed to be filled with boiling gold. Will you look at that, I said. I didn't even know she could swim. You, you didn't, the woman stepped forward, is she all right? Oh, Barry, I said, look at her, solid. But is that safe? I mean, no one else is in the water, it's so cold. 
You're right, I should join her, excuse me. I flipped my wallet and keys backwards onto the beach and waded into the frigid water until my shirt belled around me. Then I pushed off. Leaning my ear into the water, I swam a lazy side stroke past my daughter. She treaded in my vision, her glasses speckled with water. This lake is heart-stoppingly cold, I said. I mean, I think my heart just stopped. Our laughter rang out over the water. From the beach, people stared. I could see my redhead looking beautiful and puzzled on the shore. <laughs> Some things you can't explain, you just can't, no matter how sympathetic, nor how moving in her own right is the listener. Thanks. Hi. I think I have to yeah. Is that better? Does that work? OK. Um, I'm going to read from a novel called The Border of Truth. And the novel moves between 1940, um, and in those sections, a young boy named Itzhak Lejdel is uh, writing incessant letters to Eleanor Roosevelt. And um, he's <clears throat> beseeching her to help him with something to get off a, sh a particular ship. But he's also uh, quite interested in telling his narrative to her, which is uh, uh, not always about the need for help. Sometimes it's about uh, just how he got where he got. Sometimes it's about girls. He's 17 years old. Um, and, and the other part of the novel takes place in 2003, and that's not uh, in Itzhak Lejdel's voice, but it's in third person. And it, it's, um, it looks, uh, you're with a character who you come to realize is his daughter. So I'm going to try to read a little section from each part. Um, so Itzhak is making his way, or he's recounting to uh, Mrs. Roosevelt making his way. He starts out in Brussels after the bombing of Brussels and then makes his way through, um, through Europe <laughs> and eventually onto a ship called the Kwanzaa, which uh, tried to make its way. It did make its way to New York. Many of the passengers were led off. He and uh, a hundred passengers were not allowed off the ship. They went on to Mexico, um, where a few more got off, and then they were to be sent back to Europe. And so he's writing her from, uh, from Virginia, where they're reloading with coal. All that doesn't really take place in this section I'm going to read to you from. It, it's a section where he arrives in Paris. He's with his mom and with another couple who have given them a lift to Paris if that's not all confusing enough. Um, so here we go. Good afternoon, Mrs. Roosevelt. In Paris, I was a woman. I wanted to walk through Paris as a young man, dapper in a double-breasted suit. But because I was now a dodger of the Belgian army, because it was too dangerous, Mrs. Roosevelt, I wobbled in brown high heels down the Champs Elysees, disguised in women's clothes. At first, I tried on Maman's dress, which looked less on me like a dress than a tunic I might have worn in a school Latin performance. Maman, buy me a new dress. How quickly I sounded like a spoiled girl. If I could not stroll as a young man, can you blame me, Mrs. Roosevelt, for not wanting to look my best as a woman? Maman argued that I must stay indoors and not risk attracting attention of the police who were arresting young men, repatriating them for service in their country. But there was no real argument. We had much to do. We hoped to finish up papers for a Mexican visa. We had a letter from our contact Ricardo in Mexico City. We were trying to locate Manuel, Ricardo's cousin, who worked in the Mexican offices. We were to show Manuel the letters from Ricardo, which included receipt for money sent and Ricardo's promise that Manuel would secure visas. Maman understood this was not an extraction she could manage. She was visibly weaker, exhausted by organizing provisions and visiting the Bank de Lyon, awaiting a word from Max. I would also go to the library to research alternate shipping routes. Gustave and Marie, that's the other couple, had stayed with us. Before he'd left, Max extended his offer to them, believing they'd protect Maman and me. He'd even suggested to them that I might secure Mexican papers for them as Ricardo's cousins. Try this. Gustave flung a dress through the air. It was Marie's dress, 
I must have shaken my head no because Marie said, it's fine, Itzhak. Blue and silk, the dress had many tiny tucks stitched in violet that gathered at the waistband where the silk flared into a full skirt. Marie zipped me into the dress and the sensation of the silk, the pressure of her hands at my back thrilled me. For once, my ridiculous skinniness was an asset. I fastened the waist button of the matching fitted jacket. Marie's ankle strap pumps fit my feet, which caused a bit of teasing of Marie, and even the lively suggestion that Marie should wear my suit while I wore her clothes. Then Mama handed me a pair of royal blue leather gloves. How's this? And I gave a twirl, and I felt the rush of air as the dress skirt lifted and settled. Gustave and Marie whistled, and even Mama laughed, a first since she'd left Belgium. Now walk. Gustave was suddenly full of vigor. This is theater. His voice was instructive, professional, less shoulder in the gait, less gait, more lift. Like a circus master, he commanded me up and down the musty hallway of the Hotel Tulip. If he'd had a ringmaster's crop, I think he would have given me a short lashes with the training. I was determined not to be embarrassed. I learned to his grudging satisfaction how to stand, how to walk, sit cross-legged as a woman. And now to your face, he said, and he pointed to a brocade stool. He pulled at my cheeks. I flinched. Poor girl, he said, not accustomed to the hardship of beauty, I see. He licked a small brush, spit into a tub of black cake he held in his hand. He mixed the brush through a little tub, spitting, working the paint into a small, frothy mix. I was determined not to give him the satisfaction, any sign of squeamishness. Shut an eye, he said. I shut him both, waiting for him to press the brush to me. I felt his breath thick against my face. No, he said, I'm not going to get it right. And I felt him back away. Then someone leaned over me. I could feel it wasn't Gustav. Open, she said, and I felt her fingers light against my eyes, open. I opened to see Marie lean back, head angled, scrutinizing my face. From her bags, pots of color, brushes appeared, and she began as seriously as Gustav to apply cream and powder to my face. I smelled on her wrist and arm the grassy perfume that I'd watch her dab against her skin. Then I caught a whiff of myself, which wearing Marie's dress was a sweet, grassy scent. And when I adjusted my legs, my stockinged legs made the sound I'd heard her legs making in the front seat of the car. It was disconcerting, though I'll admit, Mrs. Roosevelt, not entirely unpleasant. <laughs> Keep them open, she said, when I closed my eyes. When I opened them, she was right there, frowning, evaluating my face. Good eyes, she said. Easy to take, have them take a new shape. I was still determined not to be embarrassed, but I couldn't look at her directly, and I shifted my gaze. Look at me, she said, and I turned to her and made myself count to ten and hold her stare. She yanked my chin a little roughly, tilted my head while her brush spread against my forehead and eyelids. She was playful and stroked the brush down my nose. Now let's get to those good full lips, she whispered, her breath warm against the chalky powder on my cheeks. Like this, under Marie's hands, I felt myself become a woman. I became an alluring woman with a turban, a hat, dark sunglasses, red painted lips, ready for the streets of Paris. You can imagine my terrible surprise when I stood at the mirror and saw that I was hardly the elegant mademoiselle I'd felt myself becoming. Instead, I appeared as someone's unfashionable mother. How often, Mrs. Roosevelt, we are not what we inside feel ourselves to be. But if I was not the dapper young man or even the fashionable woman I wished to be in Paris, Paris was not the Paris I dreamed of. Small lit streets opening onto squares, cafes, noisy day and night with the debate of serious young people, books, musical instruments, sketch pads, everything a boisterous declaration of everything we wanted to offer a better world. In the Paris I'd planned to walk through, film stars wrapped in scarves might be sipping a cognac at Maxime's. I'd linger watching intellectuals huddled over manuscripts or any of the French surrealist poets arguing with the futurist poets. Instead, it was foreigners, 
Foreigners choke the streets, people everywhere sleeping, cooking in streets, hanging rough shirts from street posts, stringing blankets up around makeshift latrines. Crowds and police, my walks along the Seine were not the late afternoon strolls I'd imagine holding hands with Odile or a Parisian replacement of my Odile, stopping close to the Ile de la Cité to lift a creamy face like a cup in my hands. In the Paris of this early May, the caves of the Seine were campgrounds, places where people stepped among the sleeping, looking for relatives. Had someone heard news of a relative? Do you know, have you heard word of? Was the steady refrain in German and Dutch and Russian and Polish? I heard Flemish and Italian and French and of course Yiddish. If you saw Paris as a bird might, flying over the sea, you might have thought it was just a grand picnic day after day of sunshine, the mixed up smells of food cooking on the street, like a grand festival, a world's fair gathered in that city, all the bright decorations of countries mingling. But from the ground, you would see tired ribbons of people streaming into Paris, tattered, lost, looking over shoulders for what we all knew was coming. It was hot. The cool spring was now an unseasonable swelter, and everyone looked too layered in too many clothes. Postings, polite, frantic, everywhere, tacked improbably on the stone wall. I read, cher papa, in a child's cursive hand. Jacques and I are looking for you, papa. We are being good. We take our nap here every afternoon. To be fair, the gendarme and the soldiers were overwhelmed. There were huge placards posted about the city, hung with destinations, routes out of the city. The tone was instructive, but it didn't take much to hear the undercurrent of panic in the official's voice. The gendarme had been instructed to stop everyone, look at papers, obviously impossible, absurd. And so when someone was randomly stopped, it was done with ferocious authority, as if the author had confirmed knowledge of false documents, as if it was not necessity that let most of the crowd pass the street street unchecked, but trained intuition and efficiency. Young men in particular likely to be stopped. We, all of us, no doubt belong to other countries fighting forces. Trucks every day took men back to the Belgian army. But I was not a young man, was I, Mrs. Roosevelt? Instead, dressed as a woman, I went out into the throngs looking for a word from Henri or from my father. I wished for only a chance to rant, to stumble, recite verses by Baudelaire or Rambeau, but finally my stumblings had only to do with trying to stay upright in Marie's high-heeled shoes. Here, at this juncture, Mrs. Roosevelt, I won't wear you out nor test your patience with the endless hours I spent in line. The Paris lines were practiced for the later lines in Toulouse and Perpignan, but let it suffice to say I stood for hours wobbling in heels and itchy stockings, careful to talk as little as possible, certain my voice would betray me, each day another line, each line another crowd of people overdressed pressed close together. We were refugees in Paris. It takes so little to turn anyone into a refugee. A winter coat, a scarf over an arm in June, jackets worn too long in too much heat, it droops the body down. There were those who gave in, coat unbuttoned, hanging off a weary frame, hardly looking any more like the doctor or the businessman they were just weeks ago in another city. The slightest indication left of the old established life, a telltale gold watch, a woman's pearl and ruby brooch. Now they press forward, pushing to keep their place in line, hugging an oversized valise filled with family valuables. After waiting for hours, we were directed to other lines, told offices were shut for afternoons. The word on every line was that people were being routed to Bretagne and to the Atlantic coast, where displaced persons were already up and running. There's no Manuel working here. A clerk at the Mexican consulate delivered the news to me. In his red ascot, he appeared to find himself an important fellow sitting behind his desk, as if wearing an ascot was a kind of audacious and a brave behavior. But I've been told to see Manuel. He knew Ricardo of Mexico City, didn't he? I'd been promised, I'd been promised. Madame, he said, returning his fingers, there's never been a Manuel here. But monsieur, I have an official letter. As I began to say, he said, we have only man, one Manuel, and Madame, I'm certain he's not the gentleman you're looking for. I'd like to meet him, I said, 
Very well, he laughed. I was escorted up a wide staircase, brought down a hallway with several doors, and at the end of the hallway, a low arch, and on the other side, an obese man sat on a chair. About him, a variety of buckets, a broom, a stick with a mop. Salut, Manuel, the clerk called out roughly. The woman says she must see you. I walked to the seated man. He looked inflated. I was conscious of the clerk, and I tried to make small womanly steps. Monsieur, I said, the man made no effort to stand. He looked at me with a blank stare. I had ridiculously a moment of hope. Maybe Ricardo meant for this swollen man to steal papers for me. Maybe the vacancy of his look was an intention. Monsieur, I said, Ricardo, your cousin from Mexico City has told me you could be of help. He did not even register that I had spoken. I am from Oaxaca, he said. It's a long time since I've seen Oaxaca. He stared at me as if I might speak of his city. And Ricardo, you know your cousin, right? I said. But instead, I leaned very close to him again and I said, Manuel, it is a pleasure to meet a man who takes good care to keep floors as clean and well polished as you do. Goodbye. I left then with a swish past the derisive clerk, my heels clicking down the long hall. Thanks. Everybody. Thank you for Jen. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us here to the library, and thank you for coming. Um, I didn't do my homework. I didn't figure out what to read. So, um, I, I'm um, the beginning. I could read the beginning, but well, I'll read you a paragraph of the beginning, and then you'll see that maybe the beginning is a rant. So, so I'll just read a paragraph, and then maybe we'll have had enough of the rant for a bit, and then I'll read from chapter three, which is sort of another beginning, and not too long. Um, th this this novel uh, is is called *The Woman Upstairs*, and it's uh, narrated by a woman uh, named Nora Eldridge, who is in her early 40s and a school teacher in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, and. She, um, she always wanted to be an artist, um, and she makes art, um, but she does that in her spare time in her apartment, and she always wanted to be a mom, and she has about 20 kids, but they're, they don't go home with her at night. Um, and, and, and then this family comes into her um, life. There's a, a kid in her class whose parents, is, uh, whose dad is in, in Cambridge on a fellowship. And um, the mom is an artist, and they share a studio for the year. And, uh, and, and for Nora, there, there is suddenly the opening of possibility, of all sorts of possibilities. Um, just not what you will feel when you hear the first paragraph. But anyway, um, here we go. How angry am I? You don't want to know. Nobody wants to know about that. I'm a good girl. I'm a nice girl. I'm a straight A, straight laced, good daughter, good career girl. And I never stole anybody's boyfriend. And I never ran out on a girlfriend. And I put up with my parents' shit and my brother's shit. And I'm not a girl anyhow. I'm over 40 fucking years old. And I'm good at my job. And I'm great with kids. And I held my mother's hand when she died after four years of holding her hand while she was dying. And I speak to my father every day on the telephone, every day, mind you. And what kind of weather do you have on your side of the river? Because here it's pretty gray and a bit muggy, too. It was supposed to say, great artist on my tombstone. But if I died right now, now it would say, such a good teacher, daughter, friend, instead. And what I really want to shout and want in big letters on that grave, too, is fuck you all. <laughs> so that's how it begins. Um, and, um, and, and then this is just a little bit about, about uh, a little autobiographical background bit about her family, or her, ba her, her background. From the beginning, then, but briefly, I was born into an ordinary family in a town an hour up the coast from Boston called Manchester by the Sea. The 60s were barely a ripple there at the end of the Boston commuter line. It must have been our perfect beach, 
called Singing Beach on account of its fine, pale, musical sand, but perhaps also because it is so widely and so long lauded that afforded me my delusions of grandeur. It makes sense that if you stand almost daily in the middle of a perfect crescent of shore with a vista open to eternity, you'll conceive of possibility differently from someone raised in a wooded valley or among the canyons of a big city. Or maybe, more likely, they came from my mother, fierce and strange and doomed. I had a mother and a father, a big brother, eight years bigger than me, though, so we hardly seemed of the same family. By the time I was nine, he was gone. And a tortoiseshell cat, Zipper, and a mangy, runty mutt from the shelter named Sputnik, who looked like a wig of rags on sticks. His legs were so scrawny, we marveled they didn't snap. My father worked in insurance in Boston. He took the train each morning, the 752, and he proceeded very respectably, but apparently not very successfully, because my parents never seemed to have any money to spare. My mother stayed at home and smoked cigarettes and hatched schemes. For a while, she tested cookbook recipes for a pu publisher. She was paid for it, and for months, she fed us elaborate three- and four-course meals that involved eggy sauces and frequently, as I recall, Marsala wine. Briefly and humiliatingly for me, she fancied herself a clothes designer and spent several months at the sewing machine in the spare room in a swoon of tobacco smoke. Often she held the cigarette between her lips while running a seam. I always worried that ash would fall onto the fabric. Her output was at once unusual and not unusual enough. She made paisley jersey mini dresses for girls of my size, not at first glance dissimilar to those off the rack. Come here, sugar plum, she'd call and would hold up paper patterns against my prepubescent chest, trimming away carelessly at the paper with her enormous shears, a mere whisper from my waist or my neck. But then you'd see she'd cut portholes around the midriff and edge them with rickrack so that a girl's white tummy would peer through or that she'd made the sleeves so they attached not with seams but with a flurry of ribbons, a circle of multicolored bows that would look bedraggled after a single washing. Cheerfully impractical, she ran up at least two dozen outfits of various designs the summer I was nine and then took a booth from which to flog them at the fair in a neighboring town. I refused to sit with her there in full view on a brilliant Saturday in July and went instead with my father on a tedious round of errands, the cleaners, the liquor store, the hardware store, stifling in the car but immeasurably relieved not to risk being seen by my schoolmates under my mother's hideous handmade sign. My mother was a beloved embarrassment. She sold a few of the clothes but clearly felt the experiment hadn't sufficiently succeeded and the suitcase was stowed unemptied in the attic. Before too long, the sewing machine also migrated upward and my mother entered one of her darker phases until the next eureka moment struck. Certainly my mother, unlike my father, instilled in me the sense that unpredictability was essential. Not to be like your neighbor, that's everything, she would say. And because of this, because of the bright flame of her, it took me a long time to realize that she, too, was cautious and bourgeois, frightened of the unknown, and so uncertain of herself that she could barely, hardly bear to make a mark. How else could she have stayed resolutely wedded to the ordinary, to my father, to the carefully ordained and unchanging routines of Manchester by the sea? And it explains much about me, too, about the limits of my experience, about the fact that the person I am in my head is so far from the person I am in the world. Nobody would know me from my own description of myself, which is why, when called upon, rarely I grant to provide an account, I tailor it, I adapt. I try to provide an outline that can, in some way, correlate to the outline that people understand me to have, that I suppose I actually have at this point. But who I am in my head, very few people really get to see that, almost none. It's the most precious gift I can give to bring her out of hiding. Maybe I've learned it's a mistake to reveal her at all. So from our ordinary family in our ordinary house, a center entrance colonial with its potted geraniums on the stone porch and its charmingly untended yew hedges nibbling at the windows, I made my way out into the ordinary world to the local elementary school, the local middle school, the local high school. I was popular enough, universally liked by the girls, even liked when noticed by the boys, though not in a romantic way. I was funny, haha, -ha, not peculiar. It was a <laughs> modest currency like pennies, pedestrian, somewhat laborious, but a currency nonetheless. I was funny in pub public, most often at my own expense. Education was different then and I was good at it, and so I skipped grade nine, went straight from eight to 10, which was socially a little tough at first and sealed my fate as a disastrous math student. I never learned the quadratic formula and other important tips from ninth grade math just like I missed the early dating essays and the classes in how to navigate a school dance. 
At the time, though, I wasn't embarrassed about any of this, not embarrassed to be thrown sink or swim into the second year of high school without so much as a map to the cafeteria or a primer on how cliques were lined up, or even a list of the names of my new classmates, all of whom knew one another, and some of whom knew me as their little sister's friend. No, I was proud because I knew my parents were proud because it was an elevation and a re re revelation of the fact that I was special. I'd long suspected it, and now I knew for sure I was destined. When you are a girl, you never let on that you are proud or that you know you're better at history or biology or French than the girl who sits beside you and is 18 months older. Instead, you gush about how good she is at putting on nail polish or at talking to boys, and you roll your eyes at the vaunted difficulty of the history biology French test and say, oh my god, it's going to be such a disaster. I'm so scared. And you put yourself down whenever you can so that people won't feel threatened by you, so they'll like you, because you wouldn't want them to know that in your heart you are proud and maybe even haughty and are riven by thoughts, the revelation of which would show everyone how deeply not nice you are. <laughs> you learn a whole other polite way of speaking to the people who mustn't see you clearly, and you know you get told by others that they think you're really sweet and you feel a thrill of triumph. Yes, I'm good at history, biology, French, and I'm good at this, too. It doesn't ever occur to you as you fashion your mask so carefully that it will grow into your skin and graft itself, come to seem irremovable. When you look at the boy, Josh, who skipped the grade alongside you, and you see him wiping his nose upon his sleeve and note his physical scrawniness, his chin's bloom of acne next to the other 10th grade boys with broader chests and clear square jaws, when you observe that he still takes his lunch with his old ninth grade friends, all of them boys in black t-shirts with glitter decals across the breast that say kiss or ACDC, all of them with pimply chins and wet lips and hair as lank as seaweed, you cannot see any triumph in him at all. He seems clearly to have lost, to be lost, to be a loser, because anybody knows that in the challenge you were given when you skipped a grade, social success, modest social success to be sure, but still was half the battle. When Frederica Beatty invites you to join her birthday party as sail on her father's boat with six other girls, two of whom are from the most popular set, you feel pity for Josh, who will never taste such nectar. But wait. Nobody ever pointed out that Josh, in his obliviousness, was utterly happy. He'd already taught himself the quadratic formula. He wouldn't be stymied in any area of academic advancement. In fact, he would go on to MIT and eventually become a neurobiologist with a lab largely funded by the NIH and a vast budget at his disposal. He would marry a perfectly attractive, if rather knock-kneed woman and spawn several knock-kneed bespectacled nerves, replicas of himself. It will all work out more than fine for him, and he will never for a second suspect that it could have been otherwise. He will not know that there was a social test. He will not know that he failed it. No. A sail on Frederick Abiti's father's boat was an honor that he dreamed not of, and his yen for society, such as it was, was perfectly satisfied by his old clan now a year behind him. He could no more have fashioned a mask than flown to the moon, and so he remained who he was forevermore. Femininity as masquerade, indeed. It's really fun to have a chance to read a little bit with, the, with these writers. So I'm going to read the first bit of a short story called A Week of Abalone. Can you hear me? Okay. Carlos, not a Mexican, Townsend III, was one of the Topanga boys, which meant he'd grown up wild in the hills. My family had landed out in the valley, Dust Bowl escapees, but Carlos and I were sent to the same high school. After running against each other for student body president, no one ever told me how much I lost by, we got to be friends in Miss Eisenberg's senior civics course. It was 1947, and Miss E was under investigation by the California Un-American Activities Committee. Post-war rage and disappointment were also the reigning sentiments of Carlos and my fathers, so we resolved to leave home as soon as possible. I was still a cabbage-faced kid with dirt under my nails when we moved into the hovel in West LA and started at the university in 19, 1948. UCLA was six buildings then, almost intimate. The hovel was intimate too. Three boxy garages sandwiched together, separated from the freestanding homes on both sides by thin strips of earth. To furnish the place, we salvaged a couch from the Townsend's living room and took the radio and table and chairs from sidewalks 
everything from other people's deteriorating homes. We made our own meals. Whatever else we were in our undergraduate days, we weren't mama's boys, not even as freshmen when I was learning to spell psychiatry, the name of my future profession. We slept in low to the ground cots, jammed in side by side like a refugee camp, which in a way it was. Carlos and I had a stable of brothers who rotated through when they flew the coop looking for, to peck bigger worms. My oldest brother had gone to seminary and he had a church in Pasadena, but I had higher ambitions, a medical degree. It wasn't spiritually admirable, but being a doctor was at least palpable to my father, palatable to my father. Philosophy and sociology turned him purple over mashed turnips, while mother left the table to refill the bowl. She too was pleased with my plans. You can help your father with his arthritis. Not that kind of doctor, I said. I didn't much like my pre-med classes, but studying anything was better than threshing beans beside my father and smudging orange groves for spending money. And at 48 tuition dollars per semester, even a hard scrabble farm boy like me could afford an education. When we weren't in school, Carlos and I went exploring. Money, vote, money motivated excursions like trolling back country roads for scrap metal and picking boysenberries on the hillsides. One Tuesday, a salt crusted day whose heat and green water soldered our friendship and made all that came later, including the very end, possible. Carlos decided we would dive for abalone. We'd catch enough to feed us for a week and go to the movies with the money we'd saved. He knew how to harvest the animals, which I'd never tasted, and in my mind were just big flat garden snails. Carlos swore the meat to be tender and delicious when done right and packed with calories. I was a hoarder, carefully carving out the unnecessary from each meal and stashing for the inevitable lean days. Carlos broke me of that habit by eating my savings late at night when he arrived home, ravenous from taking girls out. We'd grown up in the same depression, but Carlos's attitude was to live each day making up for what he'd missed. Carlos had borrowed a car from a friend I didn't know. Carlos had a lot of friends I didn't know. And we drove north on one to Point Doom. I said, why would God be on the side of Republicans? There's no logic to it. I was tending to another fight with my father, ignited the day before. Every Sunday, I hitchhiked to my parents' ranch to go to the church and eat my weekly ration of beef. And the previous week, I'd purposely left behind the latest issue of the New Republic. Yesterday, after saying grace, my father placed the folded publication beside his plate and stood up. He leaned his clean-shaven face over the sliced radishes and the boiled broccoli right down into mine, our nose our noses separated by a breath of hot air. What makes you think you're better than us, he said. Did you read the articles, I said? I know what they say, urging pinko sympathies on young men raised to know what is good about this country. We just saved the godforsaken world, Donald. Did you know that? Did you know how much trouble we were in? Now we're at peace, and these blind lefties are stirring up trouble all over again. I'm ashamed of you. I nodded, the old agitation rising, swirling. And finally, I said, I understand, Father. It's not for you. This magazine is for the educated, free-thinking man. <laughs> My mother did not look up. She pushed her chair back and scuffed her feet repeatedly across the floorboards in a whispering prayer. Two of my younger brothers stared hard at each other, hooting and hollering in their heads. A rooster crow carried in from the yard. The tips of his ears crimsoned first, then the lobes. The flush spread down his cheeks like irrigation water soaking a field, until the ball of his nose bloomed into a ripe tomato. His fingers locked onto the table, and I felt the tremble in my knees. Ray, my mother said. His fork curled at the floor. God gave me a better education than any of these faithless liberals. You want to join them, you find your dinner elsewhere. I pushed my plate next to my father's, then turned to kiss my mother. She murmured, God help you, which stunned me, but I had to show my back. Carlos, taking the turns in the Chevy coupe with one hand, said, fight back, Don. Carlos had thick eyebrows and a sloped nose. His cheeks were high and arrogant, but his eyes soft. Tell him he's not making sense, he said. Is that what you do, I said. My father is a drunken dolt. What he says doesn't stick to me like it sticks to you. You're still teaching Sunday school when you don't anymore believe. 
I was raised on Democrat Road, so named because it was crooked. When I'd asked my father why he hated Roosevelt, he said it was because FDR gave pride away for free. I reminded him of Roosevelt's American creed, which I'd memorized in Miss E's class. The creed of our democracy is that liberty is acquired and kept by men and women who are strong and self-reliant and possessed of such wisdom as God gives mankind. Which part didn't he agree with? Those are just words he'd said. <coughs> words would be the foundation of my psychiatry career before we became just pill pushers. Your father doesn't know who you are, Carlos said. He should know. We wouldn't get on any better, I said. You'll be a fine psychiatrist. Carlos laughed, broad teeth gleaming like a film star. The cove where we were going, he said, you could see straight down 25 feet, sand like silt between your toes. My father wasn't jealous of my education, but it rubbed him the wrong way. At heart, I think he was worried we'd end up on opposite sides, me for the poor, him for the righteous, hardworking. How could we then be father and son? Back on the farm in Colorado, we were unlucky, not poor. I stuck my hand out the window to catch the sun, flipped back and forth between a shiny scrubbed palm and brown knuckles, laced with scars from grooming the wealthy lawns in flower beds of Bel Air. Why hadn't I stayed and argued? I wanted to know. road trip, um, this Americana and this American landscape is to him still very exotic, you know, and he, in some ways, he fetishizes Ameri Americanness uh, because he's not um, a really an American. He's regarded as one, um, but he, he's not one. Um, so he's, he pretends, and I think you can see that a little bit in the scene I read, the way he apes, you know, he, he tries to seem like such a kind of guy and confidence and underneath there's a lot of uh, um, instability of the, the secrets. Um, so when I think of uh, a scene where you said in sync, a setting could either be a place could either be in sync with the character or it can work in some kind of ironic you know, juxtaposition. And I think in you know this case um, it, it does, you know, this happy scene between a, a father and a daughter that is in, well it's <laughs> It's in a happy place, tourists relaxing and, and, and being you know, naked, and, 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 and yet it's, it's uh, a scene of great angst, very buried angst for him. I don't think I mentioned that the book is also actually written from prison, because <laughs> you just get arrested. <laughs> it's a small detail. Um, you know, uh, but he, uh, you know, he, so, so I, I enjoyed that, and I really I enjoyed writing about America from a point of view of a foreigner, um, even though I'm not uh, my mother. My mother was, I think I borrowed some of, of her history. I'm not German, I've never been, um, but um, I borrowed from that. Uh, I think that sort of answers the question. Um, let's see. 
In, in the order of truth, Itzhak, who's displaced, I mean, it, it, it's the story in many ways of a 17-year-old boy who is displaced, but because he's 17, displacement is exactly what he's longing for a lot of the book. So he, um, early on in the book, when, when, um, when the Germans bomb Brussels, he confesses to having been excited by it. That it's, you know, it's a way out of what he sees as a provincial place and get me out. Um, so in that sense, his relationship to um, uh, displacement is one of, it's adolescent, it's exciting. It's, it's what, what are the possibilities? What's, what, what's he going to get out of it? So every situation he comes into has this feeling of sort of a, a kid's adventure story. Um, for him and, and what will he make of it. He has parents in the book, the mother who is referred to, and Max is the father, who uh, once displaced from home have that um, <coughs> loss, who are at a loss with themselves, who don't know themselves outside of the place where they live. So they stand in relation to place, um, constantly wanting back to a home that's been destroyed. And, the other part of um, place that comes up in the book is Sarah, the part I, I didn't get to um, read from, but when she's in New York, um, she's a New Yorker, she feels comfortable in the street. There's a lot of, you know, just walking the streets of New York and sort of feeling her home. But as she begins to understand that there's um, another story that her father hasn't told her, everyone in New York begins to look like a stranger. Everyone in New York looks to begins to look like someone with an alternate history, an alternate um, relationship to the city, you know, city of refugees. So, yeah, the place, place is sort of in, in, in the book, stands in relationship to what is it to be a refugee in the place. Mm -hmm. most of it well, the other thing I Grown up in the area and feels um, that this is a 
his home and he can do anything he wants with it and he can grow up from it and, it, and it's part of his identity. And then there's a transplant, someone who is a narrator who's um, coming after the uh, after the Dust Bowl and is getting used to what it means to be in a city versus, uh, versus the country. So um, I like thinking about that aspect of friendship, um, of people getting to know each other when one is a native and one is a, one is a transplant. Um, <coughs> Um, a question about, about research and about creating places on the page. Are there, are there aspects of a place that are the first, the first part that you go to when you want to ground the reader in a particular place? Do you think of smell or do you think of how the streets are laid out or do you think of some kinds of atmospheric conditions or, or do those just come, a little, uh, come along the way and you know, aren't necessarily at the forefront, but when you're thinking about um, creating a place for the reader. And uh, Victoria, in your piece, you have the contrast between the aerial view of Paris and what it looks like from the street level uh, with people streaming in. Uh, so maybe you could say something about that, um, about that contrast and then your general construction of, of the place. Um, when writing fiction, then perhaps poetry. <coughs> I, I was interested um, in that moment when I, when, between the notion of what something could seem like and what something is. So, you know, we've all had that situation um, where you look at something and it looks great, and then you come close and you realize, oh no, it's teeming with bugs or something. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the great classic one for me is actually here in the room. My eldest, my oldest friend. And I were at the beach, and she was in the middle of water. It's like the Steve Smith poem, and um, I was on the shore, and and she was waving to me, and I was waving back, but she was kind of drowning. And, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, when 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 I um, and and inside of that, I think what Claire was saying was exactly right about the relationship of place with with inside the novel is that it works as a kind of, it's part of the friction inside of a character's change or growth or, or the story, whether, whether there are moments in which um, uh, a, a character comes close to a place, comes, you know, identifies with it, feels settled by it or, or, or bettered by it, and then to have that taken away, as it does you know, to any of us in any given day, where we, it is part of the making of, um, of a character's path inside the book. That makes some sense. Um, I, I, I can talk a little bit about uh, how I approach um, I did my work. Um, I, I knew that I wanted Eric and, and his daughter to go on a road trip through New England. And, um, and so what I did was I got in the car and I drove. <laughs> I drove north um, through you know, Saratoga Springs and Lake George and I stopped at the beach and I heard the oars and the oar locks and I you know, saw the sign that said no fishing and I kept driving and I, and I, and I saw how close I was to Canada and then I was like, no, they don't go there. They, 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 go, they go east, and so I went and I got on the ferry and went to Vermont, and that's what they do too. Um, so I know I, when I set out to do this, and I only did it over a couple, three, three or four days, um, maybe three less, um, it was beautiful, beautiful early summer. And there was not a cloud in the sky and for, for all these days. And there's also this weird time in New England where there's like rain of white blossoms from trees. I haven't figured out what this is. Anyone knows, but it looks like snow, but it's blossoms, and it goes for a couple days. I drove during this period of time, and it was so beautiful. Ah, oh, it's so beautiful. You know, America is so beautiful. This part of it is. And I think that in large part of it. So for me, when I write about a place, I kind of have to go there. I need some a modicum of confidence and knowledge in order to write um, about a place. I don't. Unfortunately, we only get you know one life. We get one primitive early landscape, probably a childhood. Um, and beyond that, you can't, you know, I wouldn't want to keep writing about that over and over again. Um, so I think you need to develop and understand other landscapes. 
so going there. Um, then when I, as Schroeder, as the book goes along, he starts to uh, remember and become more honest about his own real childhood, which takes place in Berlin and in Germany. So in order to do that, since I said I've never been there, I read books, and it's amazing what you can do if you find the right book. Some generous author who writes, you know, beautiful details about what Berlin was like and quotes from people and, um, you know, ripping all that off and, uh, you know, <laughs> and plagiarizing and so on and so But, um, you know, um, it, it, growing from inspired by that and you're, I find it's imaginatively rich that I can really um, improvise after that. And um, I was I was glad to do the books actually coming out in Germany and I, I was pleased by that because I thought, wow, oh, the Germans thought my rendering of Germany was was somewhat accurate, um, and I thought it was really kind of great because it means you, you can kind of you can cobble it together in this way. You, like again, you just get this one life and this one primitive landscape to be able to broaden and, and to, to to try to to go other places um, and your work. <laughs> For me, it's people, but it's always people, a person in a place. And, and I think that the place is in, inseparable. Uh, it, it's almost, in, certainly in my um, fir first book, I thought of the places where my characters were as characters, almost, that, that, that they were that much part of it. Um, I, I, what, this this uh, novel is primarily set in, in Cambridge, where I live uh, now, which, which was, Odd, because I, I think I, I know exactly, um, or, or perhaps I don't know exactly what you felt. I mean, but tra that thing of traveling and seeing something and having, as it were, the perfect apprehension, just just what you need of it, right? Not 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 being overwhelmed by 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 too much and not having too little, but 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 actually just what you need. And, and on the other hand, when you um, I, I had before written about somewhere where I was actually actually living. And, um, and and there's something a bit disconcerting about it. it, it it's a little you, you feel as though uh, you're not you're not sure how much you put on the page and how much is still inside your head in some way. So 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 that that was actually an interesting experience for me to try to write about about a place that I was in. Along those lines of uh, writing about a place that you're uh, that you're in, and we touched on this. A little bit, but how do you feel about writing the, about the places that you're from? Is it something that you used to do and don't do anymore? Is it something that you have never wanted to do and determinedly avoid it, or um, you find yourself returning to these sort of uh, native uh, primitive places? But how, how does that sort of formative where you're from um, enter uh, enter into your fictional landscapes at all? Me? Okay. Um, no, 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 no. I can start again, though. I can start again. Um, you, you know, um, I'm, I'm handily from many places. So, so, uh, so I, I wouldn't, and, and, and the, the um, Salman Rushdie wrote an essay called Imaginary Homelands a long time ago. Uh, in which he talks about the experience of, of being displaced. And uh, one has to feel also that there has to be some advantage because there are so many obvious disadvantages. Uh, for a writer to be, as I say, Alice Monroe is somebody who lives in the house where her husband was born, I think, but in the town where she herself grew up, uh, who knows it to bedrock, who knows everything about it, who knows, you know, who, who it would be like somebody, you know, who's growing up in Northampton, living here, writing here, and, and knowing everything about it. You can't beat that, right? That, I mean, so, so you have to hope that they're, they're, um, you get something else uh, in, 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 in being in lots of places, especially as, as we are as, as, as a nation in increasingly uh, uh, migratory, well, that, well, whatever. Um, that seems the wrong word. I 
No, no, what are the bed weights? Do you want to see that? Nomadic. 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 We're increasingly nomadic lot. So, um, but I think, you know, one, one of the things that, that Rushdie says in his essay is that what then happens is the place you've left no longer exists. So, so the place you've left, you carry always only in your head. And, and, and so what you have are these imaginary homelands that, that's, the good part is nobody can take them away from you. Um, the bad part is uh, nobody else can see them. But if you write them down, maybe people can see them. So um, I, think, I think I have something of that relation. To, I, I lived here uh, 10 years ago and, and just up the road, Kensington Avenue, and um, our daughter was born in, in the hospital at that time. And it's a funny thing to be just here and see, see old friends, but also to, 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 to um, the knitting store is gone, huh? <laughs> I was coming up, I was coming up, and I was, I looked, you know, in the street, I was like, oh, the knitting, you know, lime, no, red something, red, like, I don't know what that is, but, no, it's not the knitting store. So, you carry always, this is the place that, that was, that, that other people, um, it moved down the street. They still exist. Yeah. 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 Growing up, I grew up in the suburbs of New York City, and um, two, uh, uh, both parents were not American. My family was from a bunch of different countries, and um, when I began to write, uh, I uh, began to look for every place other than the suburbs to write about, and every kind of syntax and diction other than the syntax and diction that I found. So a lot of stories were located in Colorado or in Tennessee. Um, and it took me quite a long time to begin to think that, um, that, the, that the repeated images and sounds um, that I heard inside my house, the sound of my grandmother's sewing machine, the, 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 the languages that my parents spoke to one another in, my mother grandmother spoke to one another and um, had not just a place, but were actually the music and the visual images that sort of really pressed urgent, that were in fact my desire to write. And um, so that was a kind of um, returning for me to learn to hear how it sounded um, at, inside of my house and on my block and in my neighborhood and, and the differences inside of that. Um, and so for even, in a, and I'm sure this is true for, for lots of people who grow up in one place who have parents who come from another place, not necessarily even other countries, but other states, but um, I grew up with more and less of the stories um, of place that my parents had inhabited. And um, part of the, um, part of what I, continuously find myself in when I'm finding a place inside of um, fiction, I guess also inside of poems, is that I begin to work inside of the imagery or the place that um, is somewhat fragmented or reimagined in my mind or constructed in my mind of their landscapes. Um, and, um, and, I, and I think that been interested in writing up uh, other writers who are first generation to know that I think that's true of us. It's one of, um, for me, in the border of truth, one of the great um, gifts of that book since there's an aspect of Itzhak's journey that, um, that is stolen from the spine of my father's family's flight out of Europe. Um, so I had the great good um, fortune of sitting down with my dad quite a bit when I was uh, writing this book. This is something I had never had an I was, you know, determined I would never admit to anyone that there was anything um, biographical at all inside this book. That immediately fell apart. But um, one of the great things was that in, 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 in asking him questions, it was a, it's a little bit like reading a, a book of someone else's. 
I was asking, you know how you hear the same stories from your parents over and over, you hear yourself telling the same stories over and over, but I was finding myself asking questions that I would have never, like, where did you go on a summer holiday? Did you go on a summer holiday? Where did you go on a summer holiday? What did you do? Where was that? Did you have a school uniform? And I would watch my dad, who's now 89, but was then in his earlier 80s, um, I could visibly watch him move into that altered state in which he would begin to inhabit a place that he hadn't inhabited for, uh, he left there when he was 17, so, and he was in his 80s. So I would say, some, tell me about your, you know, what you wear for a school uniform. And he would say something like, the socks were so itchy. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be, the, you know, because he would be wearing them again. So, you know, one of the great things about place is that it's, um, it's large, it's a room, but it's also entirely minute and textural and physical and uncomfortable. Um. <coughs> I, um, even though I was uh, just saying you only get kind of one childhood landscape, I actually don't feel like I really had one because I moved around a lot as a child. And I feel like it's a, the more I think about it, it's more an influence in terms of why I'm a writer and it influences my writing too, in the sense that I, I've never had a, a strong sense of one dominant place. And so I think I've, um, uh, uh, I, I, it affects the sort of almost sense of reality in some of my drawings. I, I mean, drawings in some of my writings. Um, um, and, um, um, and I can never, really, you know, straight realist fiction is hard for me just because I mean, even when I'm trying to write realist fiction, I don't because I don't have that sense of that grounded, real, rooted um, place. Place. Um, I uh, I wanted to say also that my hometown ish where I was um, about 12 on is, I sh is the same hometown as John Updike, which is Reading, Pennsylvania. And so once you share a hometown with John Updike, you can't write about it. You know, it's his. He's conquered it. Um, and you know, when I read Rabbit Run, and I was, I was 21, and I remember because it really blew my mind. I think it's a great novel, but it also was the place that I remembered um, from my adolescence you know, it's a depressed post-industrial city, and I had a depressed post-industrial adolescence. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he wrote about it so beautifully, and um, I wrote, I had brief correspondence with him when I was that age, and he was, um, I don't know if you know, so good about writing everyone who wrote him uh, by a tech writer by himself. And he wrote me, I remember, a postcard. I said, you know, I loved your novel. <laughs> you know, it's so great. I'm from Reading, too. And he wrote back, and he was, and he wrote, um, I, I still have it. It, it was a, a memory of, uh, from him of these things that downtown Reading used to be like. I feel like and nostalgia comes up when we talk about, you know, the distant places we've left. Um, you know, uh, and, and how beautiful the square was. And he says, it's good you've left Reading. It's good you, you know, you leave at 21 and then you can leave and make everything up. And you make the rest up. You know, which was sort of, which was sort of ironic because he had just written his list of accurate memories. I felt it was even coy in a way of saying, you make everything up. But you don't. You, you, there's some kernel of how the way it was is actually what you're writing. And, um, you make up, perhaps, um, you change the details so they're not identifiable, you know, and you won't implicate anybody, but you're really very much, you are um, constantly drawing from that place. I envy that, I wish I, I had that. Into the gallery and stop me in the magazines. And find <laughs> magazines. 